Welcome back. I'm Steve Clemens. I'm editor at large of Semaphore, a new global digital publication for a fireside chat with Eric Fanning, who is president of the Aerospace Industries Association. And of course, we knew him when he was secretary of the Army, he was undersecretary of the Air Force. He's been around military and national security uh, issues for a very long time. And we're going to have to, you know, have I think a sub, I know all of you are into this industry stuff, but we're going to have a fun conversation, but also a serious one about the state of the defense industrial base across domains, all the domains. And I want to just start out, Eric, and ask you, at this moment in time, we're looking and staring down a possible government shutdown. And, and I'm going to do lightning round with you in all of this. And I just want to get a sense, because I sometimes think we think about these things too casually. What happens to this industry? What happens to the workers, the innovators, the, the folks who are both uh, within government service, but also contractors who are funded by this? Give us the kind of um, real picture of damage, if any, that a shutdown would do. It, it does tremendous damage. Um, it's, it's bad enough we've gotten used to continuing resolutions and multiple continuing resolutions, which uh, are also damaging, slow things down. They're very inefficient. They cost the government. I tell you, in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, where I'm from, they don't know what a continuing resolution well, is. Even, you even know, like, people what's in the language don't know what it about? is. So if the Congress doesn't perform its basic function of passing a budget, um, they either shut down or they pass what's called a continuing resolution, which basically says you can keep spending um, uh, last year's budget budget levels, budget programs, whatever it is. So if it's a new start, if you're starting something new, if you're if you're starting a new program, or if you're growing a program, it's not in the previous year's budget. So that stops. So it stops on the government side and it stops on the industry side. Industry is, takes its signals from the budget, um, builds the, uh, the facility, builds the workforce, lines up the supply chain, and then it stops or it doesn't start. So that's what happens under a continuing resolution. And even people in Washington think, hey, we're keeping the lights on. So I want to take this another step, because my understanding after studying national security weapon systems for decades is one of the reasons why America is still preeminent in that is its ability to manage complex system uh, systems, a zillion different parts, a zillion different processes, you know, software, algorithms, quantum all of these things coming together, the talent behind them, the human capital part of this. So when you talk about suspending something in what is, you know, not a, you know, we're not making Model Ts anymore in assembly line. It's a very, very complex process with supply chains and a, and a very wide, we're talking about all domains. Yeah. So what's the heart attack do in that system? Um, everybody's heart attack is different. Every company, and first of all, when 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 you add a shutdown on top of it, or a serious threat of a shutdown, um, shutdowns start before they actually happen because everything pivots to planning for that. Government is figuring out how do I shut down, how do I send my workforce home, and industry is deciding what they're going to do as well. Do we keep working? Do we furlough workers? In some cases, there are no choices because let's say it's a classified government facility that shuts down because it's a government shutdown. Those workers don't have access to their workplace anymore. Uh, contract workforces, um, companies that perform services, they really get into a bind because they probably won't be compensated for whatever happened during the shutdown. Manufacturers might be, but the cash flow dries up. And that goes all the way through the supply chain to small companies that are already suffering now because of inflation, um, the perturbations from COVID, uh, supply chain disruptions. And so it's just an extra squeeze on, on the entire system. And it, you're right, the integration is more important now than ever before because of the complexity of what we're doing and really the addition of domains. It's not just underwater, why isn't underwater the space anymore. system screaming more loudly about this potential shutdown? And I want you to take off your industry hat for a minute. You were chief of staff to the Secretary of Defense. You were under Secretary of the Air Force. You know about defense planning. You were Secretary of the Army. You worked with, until another day, you know, the current chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mark Milley, uh, in the Army. What are the command staff members of the Joint Chiefs thinking and doing right now? So a number of things. They're um, certainly reaching out to their partners, partners and allies around the world to talk about what this means and how, you know, the essential national security functions continue. So um, our forward deployed forces are still going to work every day, still doing what they need to do, because in a shutdown, the government has flexibility on what they declare essential and what's non-essential. And it's different every time based on who's in leadership positions. But those important frontline responsibilities of the Department of Defense continue. So the chiefs will be assuring partners and allies that nothing changes in that regard. But a huge 
for percentage for uh, part of the leadership in the Pentagon is now focused on how do we wind down the other operations of the government? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if, if the government shuts down Monday, people will come into work, turn in their communications devices, get their letter saying that, you know, it's shut down and then they'll go home. And so it really is a, is a distraction on top of these CRs, these continuing resolutions every year that require planners to think through multiple scenarios. Do we get a full budget? Do we get a, a continuing resolution and then a budget? Do we get it? You know, because continuing resolution can be two days, mm. it can be a week, it can be a whole year. And this is a seminal year, this 24 budget for some changes as we pivot and refocus and really lean into the Indo-Pacific mm. and thinking about China. None of those programs like you know, the Air Force, for example, has many things where they have divested and are putting into new programs. Those can't start in a continuing resolution. They certainly can't start in a shutdown. One of the things we're going to pivot here, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was the health of the defense industrial base really, you know, at large. Um, and, and what I'm really interested in, I think there are a lot of people watching this broadcast right now who are in this industry, but we also have a lot of people who are not, who are interested, who may not know how all the pieces. This is largely a private industry, private enterprise, private investors, government contracts. Many of them are transnational firms. How do you create an environment that's healthy and stable, forward-directed, doing the right things, in messy democracies? Well, it's it's a complex question when you start talking about the health of the industrial base. A at the start, in many ways, it's extremely healthy. Mm -hmm. The world wants what the American defense industry makes. It is the best product that's mm -hmm. out there. But what's interesting, I don't think people realize or think about, I actually didn't think about this when I was in government. I see it now on the industry side. This entire industrial base, that's not just defense, um, it's broader than the defense industrial base. And there are a lot of companies in the defense industrial base doing non-defense non, doing non work as well, has one customer. Um, and you you could argue there are foreign military sales, but it's driven through one customer. And yeah, there's so one frame. You got to get frame. through that little it's not It's not a hardware right. store mm -hmm. um, with thousands of customers. So if you need a hammer every 20 years, you can go and get a hammer. That one customer's decisions, that one customer's budget shapes the contours of the defense industrial base over many years. So that's why we can't get an Abrams tank in a month. You, you can't, you, if you don't buy something for 20 years... Um, and you're not paying industry to keep a factory just in case, factory is going to go away. And, and the private sector is very good at being efficient and building what they need to in terms of um, capital expenditures, workforce, supply chain to, to build what the customer wants because the customer doesn't want to pay any more money than it has to. The Department of Defense wants to get as much as it can. And so it's not going to pay excess uh, to, keep a, to keep surge capacity. And now we're seeing that we have not been planning for duration. Uh, so were they, we Ukraine war when, are we too thin when it comes to redundancy? I don't think it's redundancy necessarily, but we know from our Ukraine experience and from planning a, a contingency with China that duration matters, munitions matter, be able to, to produce them over scale. You can't just surge for one year. Industry can't afford and the Pentagon can't afford to pay for inconsistent um, production. You got. You want to keep your workforce humming along at a, an efficient, stable way. Keep the factory, keep the supply chain going, so you have that dependency um, and consistency as you're building forward. And so, but that's a hard thing. So, to how do. do you find that equilibrium? Do you just plan on the fact that we're going to have serious kinetic wars that draw down? And I want to ask you something serious because um, Congressman Mike McCall out there has been saying. We've drawn down our military supplies too low for American defense. Um, I was with uh, Senator Deb Fisher, who is very, very worried about this, said not only do we have Ukraine, but we're too low for what we need and we have contingencies elsewhere in the world. We're really screwed because she looks at the defense industrial base and doesn't blame them, but said we have not given them the resources they need to, to be able to produce and, 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 and do these things. So what? how do you get the equilibrium right? So it, it requires... Um really disciplined uh, investment decisions. Hmm. Uh, and I was a part of this too. You know, when you get to the end game of building the budget every year, there's always more things you want than, than money that you right. have. And you can't buy 80% of an aircraft carrier, but you can say, I'm going to take a little risk on munitions. Hmm. And that's one of the bill payers in the end. Like I'm, I'll get 80% of what I want. It's a little bit of risk, but I'm still getting 80%. But you do that year after year, after year, after year, the industrial base um, shrinks to produce 
what you've been ordering because mm -hmm. it can't afford the, the customer DOD can't afford and the industrial base can't afford to keep that extra thing going unless you pay for it. Mm -hmm. So the department is starting to look at that. How, you know, what, what are the right levels we need and where can we pre-position some things? Maybe it's parts, maybe it's materials, maybe it's making sure you have a workforce um, so that you can surge a little faster than you would right now, but mm -hmm. you really have to be disciplined about that. So I, I worry that these lessons we're learning in Ukraine um, they could dissipate over time as we get back into, into old habits. Look, we're seeing the U.S. government shift in ways I haven't seen in, in a very long time, where all of a sudden the Department of Commerce is almost like a commanding general when it comes to the future of U.S. Uh, investments in strategic technologies and quantum and AI, but particularly chips and semiconductors, which all have relevance to the defense sector. In a way, the defense sector is driving a huge amount of that of that need and and, and money. Um, how do you think America is going to do in industrial policy? So, well, that's that's an interesting question. First of all, I would say that in in the the defense requirements for chips, for example, pale to what the consumer market wants. Right. So that's one of the things we're always paying attention to make sure that the the you're needs saying of the, you're you're easier than they are. Or we're they're smaller. Higher. We're you're smaller, smaller and but so, you're more sophisticated. Yeah, and yeah. you know, people ask yeah. me like in a government shutdown, do companies go bankrupt? Sure, some could be at risk of going bankrupt. The bigger risk is mm. that companies say, I don't want to do defense stuff anymore, mm. uh, especially in an inflationary environment. It's just too hard to work with the government. I can make money just on the commercial side. So we have to be careful from a national security perspective that the needs of the Department you of Defense- You disagree the with them, by the way? Disagree with- It's easier to deal with the private sector than with government? It's much easier to deal with the private oh, sector. Yeah. I mean, it's a you know, and there are real important reasons for that. I mean, what mm. we're building for national security is complex, it's important, it has right. to be dependable, um, but it's also taxpayer dollars. Mm. But you can um, put the- the create too many barriers, especially in an inflationary environment. We 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 hear I hear from companies about suppliers that say I'd rather pay you the defense company a mm -hmm. penalty because I'll make up more than that because I can raise my prices on the non-defense side. So the Commerce Department, yes, can they scale to do what they are being asked to do, which is a question. And they, will they, they make the right role. decisions? Will they make the right decisions? I you know sometimes I think picking winners and losers is always difficult, but. Uh, in you know buying things, buying mm. chips, whatever, incentivizing that way may be the better way to go about it. And what the market. As you started. talk to your industry members out there in the Aerospace Industries Association, in a way, I kind of think you have the Wizard of Oz job, where you're the guy behind the curtains and you see a lot more than all of us. But I'm I'm really interested in how your industry looks at innovation, particularly in the national security space, in places like India, Brazil, China, and those are you know complicated countries in various ways for us. Also, UK, France, Israel, a lot of our allies are challenging our own technical preeminence in a lot of areas. So how does your industry see the diffusion of talent, innovation in the defense space? Well, it's interesting because the, the, these are global companies. It's global markets on the non-defense side, too. Um, you know, the, the, someone once said to me, buying American makes it hard to sell American. Mm. When, we, when a defense company makes a big sale in another country, that country wants in on the economic aspect of mm. it. And so we have these things called offsets. We're like, all right, we'll, you, we'll make these parts of this plane that you're going to buy from us in your country. And that's good in terms of taking advantage of the, the resources that the world has, um, including people, it can create um, dependencies that that become problematic. You know, COVID. So there were logistical issues, or if someone is an ally one day and not an ally the next day, or 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 not as dependable. Turkey, for example, when they mm -hmm. were pushed out of the F thirty five program, they had become a really important and dependable mm -hmm. um, part of the supply chain, the global supply chain. So it gets complicated. So we watch the innovation of our adversaries very closely. Um, that d derives a lot of decisions about what we're going to buy and what we're going to build, but we we benefit from the innovation of our partners and allies. Every national defense strategy that's been around since I've been in this business talks about partners and allies. I don't think we have ever leaned into it as much as we are right now. Uh, AUKUS, for example, understanding that that's a competitive advantage we have over China and Russia. They don't have allies like we do. Mm -hmm. And we ought to be, we're, we, we, we compete, um, but we benefit from that ecosystem. That Step ecosystem. further into the AUKUS world and tell us what the state of play is now and why that... Uh, international uh, effort with our allies and what the American 
um, industrial and innovation base, how it's tied into it. So, you know, one of the great things about AUKUS is who doesn't like the Brits and the Australians, right? So it's kind of sort of an easy thing to talk about. Uh, it doesn't get the kind of opposition it might be if it's a more interesting um, mm -hmm. country, but it's an enormous undertaking. There's two pillars to it, two parts. The first is the nuclear part. Right. Um, that is not an easy thing to build the industrial base um, that would be a part of this for Australia mm -hmm. to actually start building these as well. Also on our own end, the industrial base, our shipyards are um, as efficient, meaning as thin in capacity as you could possibly have. We, we can barely make what we need. Mm. So the idea of doubling that to help give the Australians the first batch of subs while they're building their industrial base uh, is a big political issue right now because it will require a substantial investment, not just on the Australians part. Mm. And again, that's money we're leveraging. They're putting money into this, mm. but we have to put money into our own shipyards to get them up to speed, to be able to build more than we're building now. And then the second part, um, which is the non-strategic, the non-nuclear part, the government hasn't really, it's very complicated, but we're waiting for them to sort of outline what the aspects of that are. And it has to come with some real changes to technology mm. transfer regulations and regimes, foreign military sales. We have to make it easier right. because right now, um, even with our partners and allies, you know, getting them to be a part of our industrial base mm. is difficult because the regulations, you know, we're protecting our technology from getting into the wrong hands. Right. But these are as close allies as you could possibly have, and it's hard to get them what they need. You know, look, I was very excited uh, to participate in today's conference, not just because of interviewing you, but when I look at this, the the people they've assembled and looking at how you be, you know, future forward, how do you look at getting decisions right? Um, how do you make weapons decisions and investments that are not fighting yesterday's wars? I sort of feel like we're at one of those other major inflection points where you've got AI and quantum, so many new methodologies coming on. But I remember talking, I will not mention this individual's name, but about 15 years ago, I asked a person about the state of our defense industrial base and decisions and how the overall system work. And this person said, you know, we make about $30 billion of bad decisions a year. And I'm like going, wow, at that time, the National Science Foundation budget is about $5 billion. That's That's a pretty casual way to talk about $30 billion of bad decisions. Given where we are and given your knowledge of the industry and given decision making and government, are we getting any better at, at, at getting rid of that error slack, if you will? Well, first, uh, there are all sorts of estimates on what that slack is, but it's a it's a broad I didn't set come of up things. With that number. Yeah. yeah, it's and, it's a broad set of yeah. things that go in there. You know, part of it is, um, you know, we have we, the, the private sector. Um, fail quickly, fail early. I, I like to think of it as learn early mm. because the Pentagon leadership will say, we have to fail early, and then they shoot whoever fails. Um, but that really is how you learn. I mean, DARPA, for example, the Defense Advanced Research Projects mm -hmm. Agency, they 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 insist on failure because that's the only way they learn the limits of what they can do. Mm -hmm. So part of that slack is really learning. Um, but there is, there is friction in the budget process because it's inherently a political process too. And once you build something and put it someplace, mm -hmm. it has a constituency. It's in a state, it's in a congressional district, somebody's making it. And so it can be harder to pivot away from old platforms, mm. um, especially if you're if you're getting rid of them earlier than you anticipated because the nature of conflict or what you're planning for is changing. But I think, you know, yes, the, the, the Pentagon is getting better at this. There are all sorts of efforts underway, but there's a lot more work to be done um, to help the industry be as efficient as quick as it can be, and to get new entrants into the mm -hmm. industrial base. So when you're thinking about AI and these new methodologies, I was talking to a friend who's writing a book about our aging allies and also about hybrid war. So we're calling it the double graying in, uh, of our allies in the Pacific. So we have you know gray war and we have our allies, Japan, South Korea, other, they're just getting older. So I, I told him he should name the book, Can Robots Be Patriotic? <laughs> so when you kind of look at autonomous systems coming on, weapon systems, what's the state of play in that in your industry? Is there enthusiasm? Is there worry? Is there caution? Well, all of the above. Um, you know, the, this industry is always trying to think about what's next because they mm -hmm. want to have the competitive advantage. They, they want to have developed the expertise, the workforce, whatever is necessary ahead of what uh, competitors are doing. Mm -hmm. And so that, that they're always looking into the future. I think what's interesting about AI, quantum, these types of things, there's, there's two elements to this when it comes to national security. One is the Pentagon has to get better at incorporating 
technology that's developed on the outside. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, when I was born, Pentagon created GPS, created stealth, uh, and those things then went on to have commercial application. Whereas today, the, the, the technological iteration is happening faster and faster and faster mm -hmm. on the outside, and the Pentagon's having a hard time just keeping up and, and bringing it in. The second is the nature of of war or conflict, you know, a kinetic conflict in World War II, that's one nation trying to mm. impose its will on another nation. There are so many more ways to do that mm. now. Two billion people on this planet vote next year. Right. And that, you know, if you can interfere with that, um, just disrupt it. But if you could influence it, that is a way to exert control over another country that doesn't involve a Connecticut mm. interaction. And so this new technology really stretches the definition of conflict um, between nation states and non-nation states. You know, one of the things that struck me, and this may be an unfair question, but the um, Mike Roman, who's the CEO of 3M, was constantly trying to explain to people why we had a mask shortage during COVID. And that they were making all the masks they could, but they are a global corporation. They are, you know, these are non-low tech little pieces of fat, but we had a tough time getting masks produced and so much pressure that people began talking about defense industrial authorities and to come in and, and, and transform uh, various other manufacturing sites to provide this. So my question is less about masks. It's about, you know, essentially how well we are prepared for what we were talking before, serious times of you know, national need on a dark day, do we need to begin using it, using some of these authorities when we're backstopping allies or doing others? I mean, do we just need to begin looking at how we can give your members more support, more room to run, and more resources to produce what we need either today or if we have another major contingency tomorrow? Well, we did learn a lot about the Defense Production Act, um, and those authorities were utilized during COVID mm. quite effectively, for example, in the creation of the vaccine um, and the scaling of the vaccine. Uh, but there's more that could be done mm. there. But you want to be careful because you're disrupting the, the other parts of the economy in the industrial base. I think the bigger issue is making sure that, you know, that that we're basically, you know, one of the CEOs said that we we're only buying enough missiles to replace what we use in training or mm. munitions we use in training. We have to think about the capacity of the industrial base as a capability in and of itself. So mm. it's not just that you have an industrial base that makes what you want. You have an industrial base that can produce. And where can it flex? Where can mm. it flex? So that you, that military leaders and, and national leaders have um, have what they need out of that industrial base. Because because right now, and it's just like mm. what 3M encountered, um, companies get better and better and better at driving efficiencies, squeezing right. efficiencies. That does not leave room to surge. Um, in the event of a crisis, and so it's it, you know it's 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 hard though for the government to make those decisions because they are also investments and they mm. come at the expense of something else. Now, how are your folks dealing with inflation? the Fed's efforts to curb inflation, high interest rates. How are these other macroeconomic uh, factors affecting an industry where there's really only one client? So I, I, I do think that there's a reckoning coming with inflation that, that's still in front of us. It's hitting- What, what will that look like? It, what it's it's going to look like a couple of things. It's going to look, first of all, I think the next round of competitions and contracts, the Pentagon's not going to get what's expecting. It's hard for a company to project far into the future because their supply chain is skittish. Hmm. You want me to you want me to estimate what this is going to cost over five years? So they're going to put in some. They're going to protect themselves by putting in. So some of these bids that are coming back will probably be eye watering. But also, if you were planning five years ago and being able to buy five of something this hmm. year, you may end up with three. And so that I don't think the department's planning processes have fully incorporated inflation yet. And mm. part of that is when, when inflation started to hit, one of my more tenured CEOs said, there are not many people in the private sector or in government who've had to manage through inflation before. Mm. And so it's, you know, we, we we're focused on the CR, we're focused on the shutdown, but I don't think we fully incorporated what inflation is going to mean to the budget and how it's going to squeeze its buying power. You know, when I worked in the Senate in the 1990s for Senator Jeff Bingham, and it was on Armed Services Committee, there used to be reports, and I honestly don't know if they're still produced, but it would be an annual assessment and survey of America's dependency on strategic minerals, strategic technologies, investment in production elsewhere. You know, I, I think there's a, a way to look at your industry that you represent and just assume it's all within the boundaries of the United States. Uh, and that all you need is inside the matter. So tell us how true or untrue that statement is. And do you worry at all 
about ongoing structural strategic dependencies of the United States on other parts of the world? I, I do. It's much better now than it used to be. In fact, um, even on the commercial side, when, when Russia went and took Crimea, that got people's attention. Uh, and now we're thinking mm -hmm. about what China controls and our ability, if we, if we go to conflict with China, which nobody wants, and they cut off supplies that they control. So there's a lot of analysis being done of that right now, the China mm -hmm. committee in the house, for example. So we're getting better at that, but, um, but our, our desire to find things cheaper wherever they are in the world meant we lost a lot of capability, production capability, mining capability uh, here in the United States. We, we have some of those minerals, but the ability to extract them and then process them, which is really where you have environmental impact, is difficult. Right. So in one minute, we're right now near the end. I mean, you see um, the UAE sending a mission to, to Mars, uh, you know, a little hope, hope uh, probe. Uh, you see uh, India, Russia, Brazil, all back in the space race. Where is your industry with space and does America have a big enough footprint? I think it does. I, it's exciting to see. But you don't sound other. enthusiastic. You sound like, oh, maybe. Hmm. No, I think I, I, so space is one of those places where we where we build and lean into uh, international relationships. Right. Um, and and. And so it's exciting. I mean, mm. we're not going to be able to do what we want to do, getting you know to moon right. and then to Mars by ourselves. We have to do it with other countries. So that's exciting. Mm. But the amount of countries going into space, the amount of companies going into space, the amount of satellites going into space, rockets going into mm. space, we're not fully set up for that mm. volume yet. We've got to get international right. regimes in order and agreements, and so that we're right. we're not all. It's not the wild west so, up there. So really quickly, I was trying to figure out a fun way to end this. When you think about the defense industry in American movies, you guys are always the villains. What can you do to become the heroes in the film industry? Well, I think I, I oh, oh, you, you know, you, yeah. no, 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 I, yeah, it's I, true though. It's it, true. It is. It's, it's different when you're at, I mean, it's a little comedy, comedy at war. Yes, you know, yeah. the, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine changed a lot of attitudes very quickly. Right. In Silicon Valley here in Europe, it used to be that if you were investing in defense manufacturers, you got dinged on your ESG mm -hmm. scores. Now, governments in Europe are saying we should get extra points for investing. We're protecting democracy in our borders. I'm going to tell you, we're going to have this conference. We should do it in Hollywood someday. <laughs> and that way we'll get some heroes from the defense industry. They're on movie. strike. So, so, uh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Eric Fanning, president of the Aerospace Industries Association. Real pleasure. Thanks, Steve.